Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. We are in the middle uh, where we're going to begin a series entitled The Right Question. And so it's basically a series on wisdom and uh, how to make better decisions in our lives. How many of you guys made some really stupid decisions in your life and you're still paying for it? Or you're still living with it? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Bad way to start, right? Sorry. Anyways, let's remove that from the tape, please. Um, So it's basically an idea of making some good, solid uh, decisions in our lives and the way we make good decisions by asking great questions. All right. Life is all about decision making, isn't it? Decision making on a daily basis. Some of us are very quick to make decisions. Some of us need to have a bunch of knowledge and process all this stuff. And even then we can't make a decision. Some of us take a little bit more time. Uh, But isn't this the truth? We are where we are today because of the decisions that we have made for the most part. Here's what we know to be true. Our futures will be determined by our decisions. This is a practical series, okay? But how many of you guys know that some of the stuff that you know didn't necessarily turn into practice? Uh Isn't that the truth? Almost all of it. So, but our futures will be determined by our decisions. Making decisions is a little bit complicated. Um, I remember beginning in the first uh, grade, elementary school, the teacher told us, actually it started at home with my dad and mom, but I remember going to elementary school and the teachers, one of the first things they told us is what? Don't be afraid to ask questions. So I'm like, okay, thank you, because I'm all nervous. I'm, you know, seven years old, however old I am in first grade, Miss Smith. And so I'd be asking questions like, man, I need to know. Hey, what is this? What do you do here? And of course, what did she do? She would answer my questions with another question. Natalie, you don't like that, do you, man? Well, that's where I learned it from, Miss Smith. (laughs) And so finally, I was like, forget it. I'm not going to even ask questions because I'm not going to get an answer. I'm just going to get more questions. But she was thinking about something. She was thinking about helping me get better. So I'd come home and I'd start asking questions at home. Ask my dad questions. Hey, dad, what about this? Hey, dad, my guys are going to ask, they want to go riding on a bike. Can I go with them? Question. And the answer was a question. What do you think, son? I'm like, just give me an answer. He goes, no, what do you think? Where are you going to go? Who are you going to go with? What time are you going to go? What's the plan? Until you ask all that and you have all that information to come back and ask me again. It's like, ah. Okay, so I get married, and one of the things that Natalie reminds me of earlier on in my marriage, she goes, hey, why do you always ask a question when I'm asking you a question? Why do you always give me an answer with a question? I'm like, I didn't know I did that. She goes, you always do that. It's like, that's dad's fault. (laughs) I learned that in marriage, though. So now there's paybacks. Now she's the one asking questions, a lot of questions. As a matter of fact, her questions that she asks seem like a questioning, <laughs> like I'm being questioned. I'm like, and, and, and anytime you feel like you're being judged or you're being, you know, you're, you're being, I, I call it, uh, I'm being investigated. <laughs> anytime you, your, your, your emotions go up, you know, your intelligence level just goes extremely down and life is just not good. But dad knew this about life. He knew this and he was trying to teach me. He knew that our futures will be determined by our decisions. It wasn't that he didn't know the answers. He was helping me try to process so that I can come to a conclusion and come to a good, solid uh, answer to to, to my decision that I was about to make. Isn't that wisdom? I think that's wisdom. And here's the deal is that in your life, you know, your decisions are privately. One day they'll be public. But in your life, somebody's going to be affected by the decisions that you and I make. Someone will, right? People are looking at you. Friends are looking at you. Peers are looking at you. Some people will depend upon you like your children or your spouse. They're depending upon you. Some individuals will be working for you. But the point is that their lives can be better or maybe they could be made worse also based upon the decisions that you make. In other words, let me say it this way. You're not the only person that is impacted by your 
decisions. You're not the only person impacted by your decisions. As a matter of fact, the truth is, you and I have no clue who will be impacted by our decisions. There are descendants that you will never meet that will probably be impacted by the decisions that you make while you're here on this earth. Our fingerprints of decisions are on the future of someone else's life. You know, yesterday, it was a great illustration. Bless you. That sneeze no, no. Um, could impact someone else. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, yeah. The other day, um, a great illustration this brought to my attention. So we were at a memorial service. We were doing a friend of ours that passed away. And she was a good, a good friend of ours or a friend when we were growing up. But during the eulogy, one of the close members of the family came up and started sharing. I'm, sitting over, I'm standing over here in the back. And once he starts speaking, he's, he says, and this guy back here, and then he's, he's pointing to me. He goes, and this guy right here, let me tell you something about this man right here. I'm like, what is he going to say? <laughs> I'm thinking at first, but he said, this man changed my whole life. He goes, when I was young, he led me to Christ, and my whole life has changed. And I literally, I don't, even, I don't remember. I have no clue. But I made a decision when I was a young boy serving Christ to get out of my comfort zone, get out of the moments of fear and press in just to share the gospel. I couldn't save anyone. That's God's deal. But I can share with my mouth that he gave me the good news. And so one decision impacted a man's life that I had no clue was impacted. Does it make sense? The same is true about every single one of us. Think about this. Do you think your life would have been different if your parents or grandparents had decided something different about just maybe even some minor issues in their life. Absolutely, isn't it? Some of us would not have even been born if mom would have made a different decision. Some of us, not us here, but some are not here because of the decisions that people have made. What if your dad had chosen to stop picking up that bottle? What if your mom got help rather than run off and leave the family? Or vice versa, what if your dad decided to beat that habit and keep that family and press into the things of God? One decision away. We don't know who hangs in the balance of the decisions that we make. In other words, let me say it this way. Private decisions, even though they're your decisions, you're in America, you can do whatever you want. But private decisions have public outcomes, period. Private decisions will always have public outcomes. People we are, will be impacted because of the decisions that we make. And if you're a lot like me, the right questions result in better decision making. And if you're a lot like me, you want to get this right. You, you, can, you can see the ramifications of other people's lives sometimes or persuaded one way or another by the decisions that we make. Does that make sense? Now, don't get it so heavy on you that it's like you're feeling convicted that you don't do anything, that you pause, you get paralyzed. No, take ownership of it, and let's make some good, solid, quality, better decisions in life, right? So this whole idea of the right question series is basically, I'm going to introduce to you five questions that are going to be used as a framework to help you make better decisions in life. We've used these questions in our life, and I'm going to say right up front that this is not um, all these questions, these, I have a mentor of mine who I've been, man, following for since I was 20 years old. Uh, and he, some of that comes from him. Some of that comes from his son, who he passed it on to him. Uh, some of you guys know uh, Charles Stanley, the old uh, Baptist teacher, communicator. I think he's still on TV. But some of these things come from those men of God. So I'm just taking that wisdom, implementing it in my life now, I'm going to try to share that with this congregation because I think it's worth it. These questions, man, I'm going to encourage you to memorize them. Do whatever you can to, per, to share them with your children, to use them in such a way that tattoo them on your arm, put them on the mirror with lipstick on there to help you use as a framework uh, um, a grid so that you can make good, solid, quality decisions. But first, let's look at this passage real quick that I want to Take a look at it. It's in Proverbs, the 27th chapter. It's in your notes. If you have your app, you can open that up. It's there in your notes. Um, you ever remember a passage of scripture in Joel? It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decisions. Do you remember that? It's not that one right there. But I just thought about that. 
As a matter of fact, when you look at that, it, it seems as if though that the human side, the humans are going to be the ones making in the dis those decisions, and they're making multitudes of decisions in that valley. But when you look at that context, it's actually the Lord. It's actually when God is going to be judging the nations. And he's gathering all the nations. He goes, hey, come, every single one of you, gather right here in this valley. I am going to be making decisions based upon the decisions that you have made. And they have not been good decisions. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decisions. No condemnation. Thank God he already made a judgment. You know, he condemned Christ. He put sin upon him so that you and I can be free and walk in grace and freedom and mercy and compassion. Amen. That's the good news. But this particular passage right here in Proverbs 27 says it this way. Verse 12, it says, the wise see danger ahead and avoid it, but fools keep going and get into trouble. Let's say it together. Ready? The wise see danger ahead and avoid it, but fools keep going and get into trouble. Hit your neighbor right quick and let's say it one more time. The wise see danger ahead and avoid it, but fools keep going and get into trouble. You got wise people and you got foolish people in this passage, right? Who are wise people? The wise people are the people who see it. Actually, both of them see it. The wise person sees danger and the foolish person sees danger. But what is the wise? How, is it, how are they different? The wise people, they are people who see that life is connected. They are people who see that they can connect the dots. They are the people who don't make decisions immediate. They look into the future and make decisions based upon not the now, but the future. They see that the decisions that we make today will result in a preferred future or a bad future in life. Does that make sense? Wise people are individuals who recognize those things. They decide where they are and where they want to be and make decisions based upon that in every aspect. Where they, they look at where they're at spiritually. They look at where they're at financially. They look at where they're at relationally. They make decisions based upon where they want to be in those areas for their future. So when we see that, then they just pause and evaluate. The foolish people, they approach life as if it's disconnected. They just look at the immediate. They know better. They see danger. They know better when they stop and think. But here's the problem. They don't stop and think. They just what? They keep going and they get into trouble. Anybody ever have friends like that? I did. He lived in the same house and slept in the same bed as me. <laughs> so we can say this to be true. Decisions determine direction. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Your decisions will determine your direction in life. Your decisions and the decisions of others in part um, landed where you're at today. Now, when I thought about that statement, I felt myself push back a little bit. I felt myself make an excuse and start resisting a little bit because it's easy to blame others. Now, you and I both know that we make decisions that landed us where we're at today. But we also know, and this is the hard part, that other people have made decisions, poor decisions that hurt you and harmed you and broke you. And you feel as if though, based upon their decisions, you're at where you're at today. And in part, that's true. But however you responded, however you reacted, even though how difficult it was, your response is still a decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. Your response or your reaction is still a decision. My therapist used to tell me, he goes, Marcus, because when a dream dies, when people who know better hurt you, and sometimes they don't even know they hurt you, but when they wounded your soul, when a dream dies, a lie is born. So it's not what happened to you. It's the lie you believed when it happened to you. He goes, find out what that lie is and take care of that. But your response and your reaction to that, I was upset. I was going to say the wrong word, but I was upset. When, when he's told me that, I was like, you're, you're a fool. I said, I'm a therapist. I'm 80-something years old. You're a fool. <laughs> it's like, true. 
but it hurt. It hurt. I was like, wait a minute, man. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. It was no, but how you respond still, how you react still is a decision you make. And so that's true, isn't it? That's freedom right there. I don't know about you, but that's $110 right there. <laughs> but know this, a response is a decision, period. A measured response, let me just say this, a measured response is always a whole lot better than an immediate reaction. <clears throat> a measured response is, decisions not only determine your directions, but decisions also determine your story. I asked a question uh, to somebody this morning, goes, what story do you want to tell? Do you love the story that you're currently in right now? Because the decisions that you make determine your story. Consider the story that you want to tell. Consider the story that you want other people to tell about you. We see it all the time. People walk into the church. Mira, <laughs> OMG, look who's in the church. <laughs> Have you heard? Have you heard? And she's in church today? Or he's in church today? I can't believe that. Why? Because decisions, maybe that they made or maybe not, have impacted their lives, and now it's impacting other people. Does that make sense? Good news. If you don't like your story currently right now, if you don't like the chapter that you're currently in right now, you can do something about it. You're one decision away. So decide a good story. You and I can decide in today after this message, we can, we can decide for a better story. But here's what I know about all of us. Is that you, Ram? Ram, here's what I know about you. You gotta be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with where you're at right now and why you're, why you're, why you're here right now. The other day we were doing a small group in our house and uh, my grandson was passing by, he grabbed some food, he was passing by to go to his room and I said, Hayden, stop right quick. I just wanted to put him on the spot. I'm like, tell me, the, tell me the one thing you learned from your dad. And he paused and he froze and he couldn't think of anything. He goes, uh, and I started thinking, I was like, wait a minute, I've been raising him for the last 16 years. Tell me one thing your popo has taught you. What'd you learn from me? And immediately he just puts his head down and goes, honesty. I'm like, man, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. I thought I had a problem with that. But that's what he's learning from. <clears throat> so he said, not, let me just rephrase that. I don't think I have a problem with that. I'm just, okay. I caught myself. I'm like, I'm always... You know, I'm always doing stuff to myself. It's like, be honest, be honest with your, be, be truthful about where you're at. Because one of my words one year was truth. Truth in the inward parts is pleasing to the Lord. And so a lot of times I have to stop and say, why am I actually saying that? Why am I actually asking this? I have to have truth on the inward parts. He, he sees the scales, right? He sees that. And so, but it was great. So you have to be honest with yourself and you can't sell yourself. You ever sold yourself to a bad decision? We, we might be horrible salesmen, but man, when it comes to selling yourself bad decisions, we're like masters at that. We have a master's degree in that. And um, anybody ever sell yourself on a bad decision? Here's the, here's the one thing that we have in common. With every bad decision, here's the one thing that's in common. You were there. You were there, right? We were all there. Before that bad decision, though, took place, usually you sold yourself. And so whenever you find yourself selling yourself, when you find you're thinking you're, you're selling yourself to make a decision, pause. Let me give you some examples. You want to know why that girl that you picked in the very beginning now has become a vruha or a witch? You want to know why that good-looking guy that's like, man, you know, he's not, I love his good parts and, his bad parts are just, it's it okay, it'll be okay. You want to know why that good-looking guy is now your control freak? You want to know why you bought that ski boat after your friend took you on his ski boat ride? You sold yourself. You want to know why you married that person? In the multitude of all those red flags that were there on the inside, the multitude of all those multiple calls that mom was calling you on, that one call that dad said, are you sure? What do you think? Or your friends are like, are you crazy? You know why? All those things, we sold ourselves. 
We sold ourselves because it was man emotion and appetites that we have. We sell ourselves on those good things. Now, I was in Rainbow Bible Training Center, and I decided to sell myself as an awesome salesman. I figured, and I compromised in my head, that, you know what, I used to sell pot a lot. I used to, I used to be a dope seller, and I was pretty good at it. He goes, I can sell Kirby vacuum cleaners. <laughs> and so I went. I did it. I took off, and I got the pitch. And when I found myself in those living rooms throwing dirt, Vacuuming up, <laughs> selling a vacuum cleaner for $1,000, knowing that it only costs 178 I found myself compromising. I found myself lying, going through that pitch like, let me just call my manager right quick. He has a one-day deal right now. If you do it today, you'll take $200 off. And I started compromising on the inside and I was because I was selling myself like, I'm a great salesman. And I walked out of that. I didn't sell one vacuum cleaner, thank God. Now, if you bought one, I bought one later on, knowing the price, and I still bought one because I felt bad for the sales guy. It's like, dude, I know exactly what you're doing, so just stop it. But when it comes to making decisions pertaining to you, your appetites and your emotions always will overrule your intelligence. When it comes to making decisions that pertain to your life personally, it's close. Man, this is, this is for my family. I got to make money for my family. I got to provide for my household. Your emotions and your appetites always overrules most of the time your intelligence. That's why it's easy for us to know what, 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 what bad decisions you're making or what better decisions you're making. It's easy for us to look at others, but when it comes to us, it's hard because our appetites and our emotions are right there in front of us. So when you begin to sell yourself, put it on the shelf. Put yourself in time out. Just wait and pause for a little bit. Don't sell yourself. Be wise. Why? Because Proverbs 27 says, the wise see danger and they avoid it. Because we know that life is connected. What if I told you, what if I, what if I told you that there are um, five questions that you can use to help you make better decisions? Instead of looking for the right answers, you'll have the right questions to ask that will put you there in a better place to make a better decision. You know, sometimes we use the thing SWAT. You ever know, anybody ever use SWAT to make decisions? SWAT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's a great way to make decisions. If you're making a decision in business, what are the strengths of that? What are the weaknesses of that? What are the opportunities of that? What are the threats that come into play? It's like, oh, a lot of times just writing that down is like, oh, I get it. I'm not going to do that. That's dumb. But there are also not things like SWAT, but there are tools, there are questions that you can ask that will help you make good decisions. And we're going to be looking at that this week. Last thought. Have you ever noticed more often than not, when you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus often asked a lot of questions. But you also know that he avoided a lot of answers. He avoided answering people and he would constantly ask questions. Why? Because he knew that the answers that usually the people were seeking were not the ones that they needed. He knew what they needed. And so he would ask questions and it would provoke them to think, to dissect stuff on the inside, internalize stuff for them to recognize what was most important. Let me just give you some of the questions that Jesus asked real quick and I'll close. The truth, no, go back where Jesus is. Go back. Yes, that's it. What are you looking for, the disciples in John 1? I see you're looking for something. What are you looking for? You come to Crossroads Church, you guys. What are you looking for? You're looking for entertainment? You're looking for smoke and mirrors? Or are you looking for life-changing truths that will help you in your life? What, what do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? Great questions, right? This is all Jesus is talking all. It should be in red, but they're in white. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Question. I'm like, stop asking me questions. Here's another three. Do you want to get well? Do you want to have a better story? Do you want to get 
life be better for you? What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit your own soul? If God clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is, wouldn't he take care of you? You think God will take care of you? Won't he clothe you? You have little faith. Question, there's like 150, I don't even know how many, there's 150, a couple hundred questions that Jesus asked. So I have one question to leave you that I want you to walk away, take a picture of it and memorize this and hold on to this. One question that I want you to walk away with this week and just ask yourself throughout the whole week. Here's the question. Do you love your current story? Story. Do you love your current story? Do you love where you're at today? Do you love the decisions that you've made and where you're at right now? If you do, fantastic. If you feel like you can make some adjustments and want to make a better life. I remember I came to that crossroads in my life. I was like, man, I hate my story. I don't like where I'm at. I'm tired of being where I'm at right now. I needed something different. I need a change. And that's when I surrendered my life and my wife and I surrendered our lives to Christ at the age of 19 years old. So do you like your current story? If you don't, you can change it for the better. Why? Making better decisions. Now let's be honest. We always want everything God has to offer without giving anything up. Isn't that the truth? We want to buy in without selling out. But I promise you this. If you don't hold out on God, God will not hold out on you. As a matter of fact, Psalm says, no good thing will he withhold from those who are willing to walk towards him and with him. So for the next five weeks, here's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at these five questions. I'm going to give them to you. Is that all right? Or should I give them to you next week? I'll give them to you right now. This is the framework of the series. It's the truth question. Am I being honest with myself? Really? The legacy question. What story do I want to tell? The conscious question. Is there tension that deserves my attention? Sometimes we just totally bypass what our conscious is telling us. The maturity question. What's the wise thing to do? And then the relationship questions. We've gone over this for a while, but I'm going to keep hammering it. What does love require of me? That's the framework that we're going to be using for this whole month. Pastor Joel is in Alabama right now. He'll be back in the next couple of weeks. But we'll just tackle these things, and I would encourage you, if you know people in your life or in your home, specifically teenagers, high school students, college students, those that have children under the age of 10, those guys, it's, it's for everyone, for all of us. But those guys, man, they can really change their whole future if they come and just partake and listen and do some of these things that we're going to be talking about this month. Is that all right? All right. Do you guys get anything out of this? Let's all stand real quick. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you don't like your story. You don't like where you're at today. You're in that same place where I was at when I was 19, 20 years old. I made a decision to change my story, not even knowing that I needed what I was doing, really. I just knew that I needed God. I figured if God created me, God would be the one that can help me redirect my life and I could pursue him. He would make it better somehow. Yes. My wife prayed a prayer. She says, man, God, just change us. We don't like the way we're living. And just by a miracle, we surrendered. We said a prayer, a prayer of repentance, a prayer that just laid down our lives at the altar we said, man, God, we're tired of doing what we do. We want to serve you. We want to figure out how you want us to live this life. And he just totally transformed us. Not overnight, but the, 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 the event took place in that moment. But it's taken place for the rest of our lives, even today. He's transforming our lives as we seek him. So if you're here this morning and you don't like your story and you realize that you've never made a decision to follow after Christ, I want to pray with you. If you've never made that decision before, you want me to include you in this prayer, could you just lift up your hand because I would love to pray with you this morning. You've never made a decision to Christ. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. I see your hand out there, sir. Don't be ashamed. It's a decision. That's another decision. I don't want to raise my hand because I'm afraid of what other people will think. Who cares? No one will stand before you and Jesus. No person on your left or on your right will stand, be there when you stand before the master. It's only you and him. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.